The presenting sponsor for On Education is Schoology. Every day, millions of students, parents, faculty, and administrators from more than 1,600 school districts leverage Schoology to advance what is possible in education. The team at Schoology is passionate about making its users successful, and they know sometimes you might need a little help to achieve your desired outcomes. To help districts find their way to success, Schoology has created Schoology Compass, a set of self-service resources and tools to support school and district leaders in their journey to success. Compass is made up of five district success routes. Each one is designed to advance what is possible at your district. To learn more about Schoology Compass, simply visit Schoology.com. Buddy, there's never a dull moment with this. Welcome to On Education. I'm Mike Washburn. And I'm Glenn Irvin. Friends, we have an awesome pod for you today. We will discuss the Remind app and Verizon battle how classrooms are resembling arcades, new research on screen time, the LA teacher strikes, and our guest this week is Phil Stubbs, CEO of Verso. Jeez, so much going on. It's a lot. (laughs) It's quite an introduction. (laughs) We didn't do a, we didn't do any, did we do an on education now this week? Mm, Yeah, on Monday. On Monday. But that's it. Yeah, yeah. So much going on. Yeah, it's a ton of different content here just a variety of different educational topics uh i mean of course with the la teacher strikes you know that being kind of the the lead story right now in education um i i love i loved the what was your first take on the gillette commercial what was like your like right off the bat when you saw it like what did you would you think like just top of mind I didn't understand what the outrage was about. (laughs) Right. But but I guess that makes me a a liberal. (laughs) Yeah, no, for sure. But did you, so did you see it after reading about the outrage? No, I, you know, you sent something to me, a text or something about. I put uh, it on Facebook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I, uh, I, I was actually at parent teacher conferences and my coworker and I watched the video together. Hmm before uh I, all i read was some kind of controversy yeah. and as we as we read as we sorry as we watched the whole video we just looked at each other and said so what's the controversy right. here and really i guess if if this is a controversial topic to you as a male or yeah, female you're the target then, of the ad then something <laughs> is wrong exactly it's it's actually really empowering uh like you, you had put maybe on Facebook or wherever it might be uh, for us to take a look at ourselves as men, as fathers, brothers, right. And really about how we're going to, you know, move forward, you know, as far as uh, how we treat women, uh, how we uh, raise our kids Mm -hmm. um, and just kind of what's, what's right and what's wrong, you know, and kind of really calling those things out. That's what I really liked about the commercial is at the end, they really do stand up for all of these different situations and make a difference, which mm-hmm. I mean, what, how could you be angry about that? I'm not sure. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I saw, I saw a couple interesting takes on this. The one that I, I like the most is that this isn't, this isn't uh, a commercial about masculinity. This is a commercial about toxic masculinity and they aren't the same thing. And you can be proud to be a man, quote unquote. You can be proud to be masculine without being all of the things that are associated with what's a problem. Like, I, I'll acknowledge that I think the word masculine is has become a negative. Oh, yeah. And, and that's, to be honest, I'm fine with that in the sense that, I mean it's become a negative because it's been associated with the negative things that males have historically done. I mean, but I saw related to that take was this really cool meme that, that showed up where it had pictures of like people like Lynn Manuel Miranda and Terry Crews and, and these, these, these men who I, I mean are every bit masculine, but demonstrating their masculinity in good ways, honorable ways, awesome yes. ways. I mean, I, I wouldn't want to stand in front of Terry Crews on any day and tell him that he wasn't masculine. You know what I'm saying? Like, so, I mean, go ahead and try that. 
I mean, good luck to you. Um, but so you know what I mean? Like, yes, like there I are do. ways to be. I, I think the best way men can be men is by teaching their boys. One of the best ways by teaching their boys how to be respectful and honorable to everybody. Yes. Um, and uh, I mean, we are both fathers of boys. Yes. And uh, I, 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 I got teary eyed. Like I, I broke down. Like I thought about it, and I was like, "Man, I, I hope I raise my boys to be, you know, the best human beings they can possibly be." Absolutely. And um, it's hard work, man. It's I tell you, it's a lot easier to raise your kids to be little brats. <laughs> It is. Well that, well, that doesn't take any work. I mean, it takes no work. It, society it, is going to, I mean, at least current society is going to lead them in a specific direction. And that direction, a lot of times, is not a good direction. So no. it takes uh, parenting uh, and it takes standing up and really telling them right from wrong and showing them too uh, how you act, how we act towards our spouses. Yeah. How, we, how we treat other people, you know, those, yeah. they, that's the real true test is they can see it, uh, the way that we are reacting to things and that's what they're going to emulate. Um, yeah. And before, you know, as they grow up, because you're right. I mean, it doesn't take much to raise kids who uh, aren't very nice people. <laughs> no, that's, that's the, that's, that's the easy way out. Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, in, uh, hopefully, you know, I'd like to think that a lot of the people listening to this are, are are working really hard at their careers and their jobs and they're trying to be in particular the best educators they can be. And, and you know, so in the end, I just I just pray that, you know, they're also putting that same amount of effort into being the best parents they can be as well. Yes. Because, um, I mean, it's 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 really hard work being a parent and being a good parent. Um, and and so job. like. It's funny because on that Facebook post where I posted, um, you know, I replied after that, right? Yeah. With like, you know, I wanted to call out the awesome parents of boys that I know. And because, again, I respect that people are putting in the work, you know, and there are a lot of you and a lot of fathers I know that are working their asses off to be awesome parents to their boys and teaching them how to be proper people not yes. just not just proper men but you know human beings that are amazing yes. and we do more of that and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna write the ship that we're currently sinking in I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite um, a ship too <laughs> <laughs> so s- switching gears i guess we this has been a, a bit of a roller coaster this remind versus verizon thing yes um you know, go, go through what's, what's the deal with this? What's happening with remind? This is a pretty, pretty bad situation for them. Yes. I mean, if you don't know what remind is, it's uh, probably the most widely used app uh, service, I guess it would be uh, by teachers, uh, students, and uh, their parents to basically do communication. That's safe. Uh, What it does is uh, it, it solved us a problem that was, that teachers had basically of being able to communicate with parents in a safe way and students uh, without having to give away your phone number. Right. Um, Because we know that that can uh, turn out all kinds of bad ways. uh, If if you're having those types of communication with text messages, for example. Mm -hmm. So they solve this problem and they are the, not only the number one company, but they're basically the only service. We started actually looking at our school district for alternates, you know, alternative, sorry, to this. And there really isn't any because they dominate the space. And not only do they dominate the space, but it's free. (laughs) So you can sign up for it and use the service for free. And what's happened is Verizon, which is the, I I guess, the biggest phone carrier, at least uh, that's what it seems like in in the United States. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, in the United States. Um, has this had decided that that because of the amount of text messages that were being sent, uh, basically from for remind that they needed to go ahead and charge, you know, uh, kind of that that uh, for that service, and because remind is free, <laughs> they saw this basically as kind of this is a 
non-starter. Like they would bankrupt their company. I think it's terrible that we have to actually look for new services. Like this is screwing Remind pretty bad. Like they're a legitimate company, right? And yes. and now you have people looking for alternatives just because Verizon's messing them around. Yeah, and I mean, there, like I just told you, there really is no alternative to yeah, a no. text-based service like this. The when you look down the list of the alternatives, it's basically a a, a web app solution. And the problem is, is that we have yeah. many parents that have uh, don't have smartphones. Uh, and I mean, as much as as weird as that might seem to some people, there's a, still quite a few people that do not have smartphones and. They have uh, just the text messaging, like old school way, um, and they need those text messages sent to them when there's a update or a, a thing that says, "Hey, we're going to arrive at 5 p.m. Uh, make sure you're uh, drop off your students at this time, etc." Uh, so, yeah. so many back and forth conversations that happen with this specific thing. So, hopefully, they figure this out. Hopefully, they sign this contract and the deal gets done and yes, they are able to, to actually not get, you know, charged for all this stuff. And, and I know that uh, I had tweeted about it happening in Canada as well. Apparently bell and Rogers are, are both also planning on charging remind. Wow. Uh, so, so it's, it's, you know, it's coming at them from multiple directions. So we'll see if, uh, if it's actually, you know, if, if hopefully Bell and Rogers uh, see what's going on with Remind and Verizon and, you know, follow suit because it could be a real problem uh, for Remind all across the board, I guess. We do have, though, Mike, there is a solution, of course, that people figured out a kind of a backwards way to hack the system, if you want to call it that way. Mm. Um, and we can post this kind of thing on online or with our account. And basically, we'll post the article. Somebody wrote kind of how to go about uh, tricking the system into making sure that they actually sends out a text message, even though you sign up with an email address through SMS. Um, so we'll post that link in our uh, oh, either fancy. either uh, on Twitter or whatever it might be to this blog post, but it does work. We did a trial run on it. We signed up with a fake account. We put some uh, kind of followed the instructions and then had it send it out and it sent it as a text message, as SMS text message. So it, it's not actually super difficult to sign up. It, the only problem is, is that we do all of these signups for Remind at the beginning of a school year. Yeah. So we have all of our parents and we teach them how to log in, blah, blah, blah. They sign up and then they join these specific groups, mm -hmm. uh, the activities, and then they get these messages. But now they have to re-sign up and then change that specific, uh, you know, the phone number into this kind of email address slash phone number uh, hack that someone figured out how to kind of go about, uh, you know, kind of skirting it. Uh, and then using the SMS function on our, uh, uh, the ability to be able to do that wild mm -hmm. so also coming across our screens this week was this really funny article that i guess when you posted <laughs> it i think you posted it first on facebook and and i didn't really add some nuance to my response and the article's title was class u.s classrooms are starting to look more like arcades and i just wrote i'm fine with that uh, <laughs> you know, deep cutting insight, I guess, <laughs> for me. Um, but it actually is a pretty decent article and it gives some shout outs to some pretty smart, smart people. I, I, I talk about the, um, uh, the quest for learning, uh, quest to learn school in, in New York all the time. Um, they actually wrote a, basically a turnkey school curriculum. Yeah. They open sourced their whole curriculum so that if you wanted to start like a, a private school or, or something you could literally basically pull their whole curriculum and, 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 and open a school. Uh, so I, I, I looked through that at one point, which I thought was really interesting, but uh, I mean, this is all stuff we kind of know, right? Yes. Um, uh, I mean, it, it talks a variety of different things, you know, using gamification actually. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know if they actually know the difference between gamification and game-based learning, but they describe <laughs> game-based learning also. In, in the article right. itself. Uh, and I, I think it's a great thing. We talk about this all the time as far as uh, uh, things like class craft and being able to use that in your classrooms and how uh, just how much more engaged your students will be and buy in into your class. 
uh, and how you could still use your specific content to be able to teach, yet be yeah. able to layer these game elements in your classroom uh, just to make it more fun. Um, and not only make it more fun, but engaging and, and really get some buy-in from our students. Anything that makes games-based learning more mainstream, more part of the regular news, is something I'm for. Yes. So, I mean, if, 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 this, if the people, parents come across this article and go, huh, this sounds really interesting. Maybe I'm not going to be such a jerk when my, my kids play Minecraft at school. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Yes. I'm, I'm for that. Maybe. Hey, maybe these teachers know something about educating my kids after all. Yeah, uh, maybe because they read an ABC. Uh-huh. Right. Because they read this ABC news article and they go, huh? Now it's legit. Uh, you know, that's good. It's fine. It's great. I, I love that they talked about things like characters and different powers and abilities and uh, all this fun stuff that kids love to be a part of. Um, when they're when they're learning, we know this. We know this because Classcraft is crushing it right now with this exact same stuff with the rules and the achievements and the XP and the and all that stuff. So um, anything that that makes this more mainstream and and commonly accepted is is good in my books. It was it was a pretty pretty good article. Yeah, we'll make uh, sure we the link reason- it there. Yeah, for sure. The yeah. reason why I said screen time is because the next article is about uh, screen time. And and this article we read was talking about the idea that instead of, you know, backing our kids out of screen time, let's let's lean into the fact that our kids live in a world full of screens. And instead of, you know, shunning them, let's just figure out how to use them smarter and use them better and be better with them. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. We talk about this all the time and you just say the the best thing that we can do with that has to do with screen time or just being in a digital citizen is making sure that we're there to guide them instead of mm-hmm. saying you're, you know, you can only have a certain amount of time on the screen. That's almost practically impossible now in a one-to-one kind of uh, environment at school. So you have to say, hey, what are we actually doing on these things and be a, a parent where we're, I took it also too, as kind of like literally leaning in to their screen and saying, what are you working on? Tell me, yeah. show me what you're doing or participate in whatever they're doing. You know, like we do as far as with our kids, if they're actually playing games and say, hey, is this appropriate for you? Do I need to, you know, uh, say, no, we, we are not going to be doing this. And here's why, you know, teaching moments and those kinds of things. Um, instead of saying, hey, you have two hours, <laughs> I'm going to step away. The little timer goes off, boom, it's done. Um, it, you always talk about this too. It's just saying, just make sure you ha- you're you managing these things and then saying, um, use them responsibly and and making sure that you you understand as a parent, what are they actually doing on there? Right. We don't want to blow a lot of the content um, on this stuff because uh, so the, the article that we're talking about um, is is an interview with um, the, the awesome Jordan Shapiro, who is actually going to be on the podcast um, coming up uh, in the next couple months. We're, we're making those arrangements now and it's in relation to uh, his new book. So we're going to get a copy of the book. We're going to do some reading. Uh, we're reading a lot of books now. <laughs> we're getting we're getting at least I think three books in the next little while in the next couple months, three or four books to read. We got to do a lot of reading, Glenn. That's great. And then uh, and then talking to authors, uh, which is you know I think I think this is this is where we belong in terms of talking to people. So um, it's going to be exciting. So we're going to talk to Jordan uh, when he comes on the podcast after we get a chance to take a look at his book. Um, but I mean, again, this is all seems like pretty common sense to us. It, it is stuff that we've been been talking about uh, for for quite a while. Um, when we come back, uh, we're going to talk uh, about the strikes uh, in particular going on in L.A. Quests. One of Classcraft's most popular features with over 100,000 lessons created by teachers and 3 million learning objectives completed by students so far is now part of Classcraft's free offerings. In 2019, your students won't just be learning multiplication, chemistry, or any other content. They'll be saving the kingdom. Transform your lessons into adventures with Quest today. Visit Classcraft.com for more information. All right, welcome back to the podcast. This has been a crazy week in L.A. Uh, 
they went uh the la teachers went on strike on monday glenn monday yes and they still are not back in the classrooms and the superintendent vowed to keep the schools open and so they did uh though Mm -hmm. it's reported that a huge chunk of students are just not coming to school yeah Uh, the ones that are the reports are that you know they're hosting classes in big auditoriums and really not uh you know i not much is happening. Uh, I did did see some principals and other non-teaching staff teaching classes, which that's actually very interesting to me because I would want to know what their experience was, you know, uh, coming back into the classroom or whatever it might be. (laughs) They were teaching, you know, I saw several different classrooms, little kids, elementary school students, uh, some high school classes that some uh, uh, administrators were teaching. Uh, So, they said that they're finding uh, administrators. They, of course, uh, they're finding some substitutes that basically are crossing the picket lines. Uh, and then mm-hmm. they're finding uh, some volunteers to actually come into the school to be able to do some uh, teaching to the students that are showing up. But it's definitely putting a hurt on them. And then I think it was Thursday, they decided to go ahead and start meeting again, Thursday evening. Mm-hmm. Um, and then now it's basically negotiations are happening, but they're behind closed doors. Is that right? I mean, it seems like they're, they're meeting and they're, they're talking at least. Um, and, and, you know, they're, they're trying to progress, uh, behind closed doors, but they're, it doesn't look like they're getting really anywhere, Yeah, which is, you know, unfortunate. Uh, I mean, so I don't know. I don't know what the the game plan is for this, but I'll tell you though the rallies, the pictures of the rallies that I'm seeing, uh, and the you know the protesting and whatever on the the streets are pretty intense. There's lots of lots of people out there rallying. So that I mean that seems like a positive thing, at least in the sense that they're the the support seems strong still. Is I guess what I'm saying. Yes, lots of support, lots of teachers out there, even up until Thursday when they were going to meet. And I'm not sure if they went back out on Friday. I think they probably did. Uh, but yeah, those lines, I mean, the, the, the crazy shots from, you know, the sky, as far as being able to see how big these uh, crowds are, it's crazy. I mean, it's, it's uh, like I saw a little meme about it's bigger than Trump's inaugural <laughs> uh, address yeah, 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 yeah. or whatever it might be. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I'm, uh, I'm happy for them. I hope that they are able to reach a resolution that addresses many of these topics, especially the one that's the most concerning to me is that classroom size. Uh, if I was a parent, that's the one that would Unbelievable. be, that would be the one that I would be the most concerned with. I mean, obviously pay is important and benefits and those yeah. kinds of things. And to make sure that we have nurses and counselors and those types of things in the, in, in the school, those are great things to be able to strike for. But the classroom mm-hmm. sizes at 45, you know, at the high school and 35 in the elementary, no wonder our parents are sending their kids to alternative, uh, you know, educational settings. You know, these, yeah. these charter schools or these private schools or whatever it might be. And it's it just lack of funding. I mean, they're not doing it because, it, you know, thing is just that's the number game that they have to play. They have to put 35 kids per teacher in order to be able to fit it in within the budget. Um, so I thought that that's the most concerning thing. Uh, and the thing that, that I hope that they really do address and, and do something about these giant classes are a huge problem. And I mean, um, any parent should be on board with their kid getting more attention from the teacher because the teacher's not teaching 45 kids or 40 kids. I, I, the max class size at the school I taught at was 24. Wow. That's great. And, and even that, I mean, when you are teaching something like computer science, where it really does involve a lot of you kind of getting around to the kids and trying to communicate with them and talk to them and see what they're, they're doing on their screens. Uh, you can't, I mean, even with 24 kids, that's a lot. That's a lot of screens that you need to have, you know, an eye on and, and be watching what they're doing and, and aware. Um, so I, I mean, these, these huge class sizes have got to go down. It's, it's, it's a major problem. Now, I'll tell you, this is a, there's, there's a new 
uh, new governor in California, who's the next big thing, or at least one of the next big things. And, you know, Eric Garcetti is a, a 2020 hopeful. Yeah. So for, I mean, for sure. I mean, he hasn't said it yet, but I mean, everyone knows. Uh, so huge test for these two guys that, uh, you know, do have a, a pretty big future um, to, to, um, to lean on and, and try to get things done so they can say, you know, that they didn't, uh, they didn't screw this up. This is a huge test uh, for two progressive, fairly progressive dudes uh, that, uh, that need to show that they're not messing teachers around because uh, yeah, this is a big deal. If I was them too, uh, I would also want to address that class size issue. Uh, number sure. one, uh, the two things that I was thinking about class sizes that are really detrimental or could be amazing for teaching. Here, here's what it is. Number one, the ability to form relationships with students. That's the first thing that we're taught is that's how you're going to manage your classroom the best. That's how you're going to get them to buy into what you're doing. If you have 45 students in your class, that is extremely difficult slash impossible to do. Because yeah. that's 45 individual people that you're trying to form this yep. kind of bonding relationship with and, and make sure that they know that you're on their side, you're you're with them and, and uh, that you care about them. And then the second thing is with really good teaching, you're going to give uh, timely feedback, uh, formative assessments and those types of things. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If you have 45 students per class, how are you going to – It's almost impossible. How are you going to so do that? It's – I mean it's – People are doing it right now, which is just amazing and awesome. But that's ridiculous to ask that of teachers. And how much more feedback can you give to less students? Of course, that that you know that's what you have to think of. Is if you had twenty some students versus forty some, I can actually work with my students to help them improve their abilities in my classroom. Uh, and, and we talk about that timely feedback on their work and then help them progress towards whatever the, the, the standards that you're trying to achieve. If you can't, it's uh, not that it's impossible because they're doing it right now, but it's just, it, it's just crazy to think that I, I would have that many students in a class. I mean, isn't the nightmare being like, imagine being a brand new teacher first year in like the inner areas the downtown areas of la where there's like inequality and and uh lots of lots of issues related to that and stuff like that i mean and then you're you're going into like these giant 30 40 student classes i mean that's that's a nightmare that's an epic brutal nightmare that i can't even imagine you would be a super human teacher to make it through that and say that you felt like you did, did a good job and were super effective in that, in that environment. Yeah. And I mean, what's crazy is that that's what they were doing previous to the strike and just saying, Hey, we need to address this. That's really what their thing is. They, uh, our class sizes are ridiculous. How about we go ahead and address this? Let's put some money towards being able to hire more teachers. Let's spread out the numbers so that we're able to go ahead and do a better job. I mean, that's really what they want to do. It's just crazy. And hopefully they do reach a resolution and that specific thing gets uh, resolved or at least addressed. So we'll do our best to keep you posted this week uh, on what goes on. And uh, maybe you'll see uh, one or two uh, of our little on education now. Uh, When we come back, uh, we're going to chat with Phil Stubbs. All right, welcome back to the podcast, everyone. We're thrilled to be joined uh, today by Phil Stubbs, who is the CEO of Verso. It's actually six in the morning in Australia where where Phil is. So wow. he's a he's a trooper getting up uh, early on Monday morning to talk to us. Welcome to the podcast, Phil. Thanks, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Awesome. Can you just give us a handle on on you and your role, what, what you're doing at Verso, and and tell us a little bit about your company, I guess. Well, Verso is um, basically we're an organisation that's an education company. We've um, been working with schools for the last probably 15, 12 years, and in that time we've developed um, structures and strategies for online and offline collaboration. So um, our platform, for want of a better word, is an environment where teachers can work with their students to 
um, build collaborative experiences that um, are designed as formative assessments that at the simultaneously give the teacher an indication of where the kids are at, but also allow the students to work together to move the learning forward. And around the online component, we've built a whole bank of offline collaborative structures that the students mm. can use before, during and after, because what's really important is that when students are using any kind of technology, that they have thinking time, time to collaborate, equitable structures that allow children to perform at their best when they come to the online component. And then once they've contributed online, then what do they do with that shared experience now? Where do they take that? Um, how do they synthesize, analyze, compare, contrast? You know, where does that go? And what we've been doing as a company that is working with teachers to actually look at ways of reconnecting students with the learning, looking at using Verso not just as a collaborative learning tool, but also as a way of actually rethinking um, learning design and making the learning experience of students in the classroom intentional. And I think the intentional component is something we've put a lot of emphasis into this year because what we're finding is teachers are using all kinds of applications on the fly, um, or even when they plan to use them, they're not equipping students with the skills, the language, the structures to engage at the highest possible level when they come together. So Verso is really a, a way of being in the classroom. And it's we, we believe, it's sort of the James Britton quote, that learning floats in a sea of talk. Hmm. And if you're going to build relationships in the classroom and shift relationships in the classroom between and amongst the students and the teacher and, and change the relationship with knowledge. You really have to equip the students to take part, to find their voice, for all students then to be able to apply their voice in the right way at the right time. And an essential component of that that we've really been working hard on this year, which is something that we're presenting at FETC, is the notion of driving that shift through the use of high-level vocabulary and mm. using that vocabulary to design learning experiences but to and, and to shift the needle in terms of the collaborative experience, in terms of lesson design, you know, and in terms of the way we engage with and we engage the students with one another in the classroom. So, Phil, I'm an instructional coach and for high school teachers, and you do a lot of work with teachers also. So yeah. what are some high-impact teaching strategies that we can share with our audience, who is mostly teachers, to go from that surface level to deep right. student learning? Okay, so the, the thing where a lot of people are getting it wrong um, is teachers are trying to, to go deep without sufficient surface. And mm. there's a notion, particularly when you look at schools that are looking at things like PBL, Yes. Uh, the problems presented to the students before they've got sufficient knowledge to, to, to go deep. You can't go deep and you can't connect dots until you've got the dots to connect. To, you've collected <laughs> enough dots. So what we're working really hard on is building structures in the classroom that allow the, the students to collect the knowledge, 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 and then where the online component comes in is – in allowing the kids to engage with that knowledge to take the deep dive and actually forge connections, that relational thinking. Um, and, and then once they forge those connections to actually engage with one another's thinking in really interesting and dynamic ways. And again, the key to that is the whole notion of teacher clarity um, and planning for that level of engagement to happen. What, what I'm seeing in a lot of classrooms, you know, all over the world is teachers with good intent post the learning objective in, on the on the classroom board. Um, they've planned for the kids to collaborate, but they haven't actually structured the collaboration in a way that's going to deliver what it is they had in mind at the start. So they yes. haven't equipped students to take part. That deep dive won't happen automatically. You can want it and hope for it, but unless you intentionally plan for it to happen and you build structures for that to happen, it won't happen in, in, in the way that the learning design has to be in place. We, yeah. we see a lot of teachers 
saying, oh, I'm going to get there. I saw a lesson a few weeks ago where the students were talking about the notion of poverty. And they're having a, a, you know, a powerful discussion in class, but it really wasn't collaborative. It wasn't equitable. Certain, certain voices were being heard more than others. Other kids couldn't, didn't feel they could take part. And at the end of it, the learning hadn't really progressed because the teacher hadn't planned and structured that conversation in a way that required kids, gave kids, every kid a chance to find their voice, to apply their voice. And so when it came to actually the deep question that required some kind of um, pulling together of what we've learned, um, the the majority of the students in the classroom couldn't do it um, because they just hadn't got what was required. They, They knew stuff but not enough stuff to take the deep dive. So it's really about, we do really as teachers have to think about um, that intentional component. Kids it's, have to have conversation and engage with, with, with the, the dots in order then to take them, take them deep. And I think we, we hope for it, but we don't always plan for it. So you're, we talk a lot, and we talk a lot about student voice and student choice uh, in our class. I, I was a computer science teacher and, and had a, a, a really kind of free-flowing classroom where, where uh, our, my students could really choose a, a lot uh, of the direction. And, um, and, and you're talking a lot about, I also like uh, that you're talking a lot about equity and equitable conversation and and this isn't i'm going to merge kind of two of our questions together because i i think you've hit on something really interesting here um and and that's it i mean some teachers just don't necessarily know how to do that how to um get equitable conversation so that all of the students in the class are are operating at the same level or yeah. or a similar level of understanding about something like poverty so that when it comes to that did we hit this learning objective you have students that are lower because they weren't equitably involved in the conversation so yeah. if we're thinking about professional development what are some ways that we can um, we can teach teachers how to um, how to make those types of experiences more equitable in the classroom? Do you think? Well, the, f- the first thing that teachers have to do to make that happen is 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 go into a lesson with the premise that a lesson is not a lesson unless learnings move forward for every student in the room. Um, so when when we're working with with teachers, we um, put the proposition to them that you know, think of yourself as a student. But so many classrooms, the students come in a room by themselves, they sit down at a desk by themselves, they engage at a certain level of the lesson, and then they leave. We've built structures around the lesson that, that in any given lesson, every student in the room should have the opportunity and should be required to work with every other student in that room. So you're not going to take learning forward until teachers start to think about the you know, collaboration and the relationships they've got in the classroom. Every student in the room is a resource. So the collaborative structures we've built are, are basically, we call them recipe cards. They're five minute structures that you can take based on the stage of the lesson you're, 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 you're engaging with, whether that's um, engaging kids in recall, thinking about prior, what, they've, what they bring to the room, which we so often leave out. Um, what do kids know already? And if 40% of what we teach, kids already know something about. They've, they've already touched on it. So value what the kids bring, but then plan for them to have an opportunity to surface that. Um, mm. Kids can't leave the room. with. Kids need to develop the, the mindset that I cannot learn in this classroom without hearing other voices. And my voice is important, is critical to every other student in this room. So they can't learn without like me. And once you get that premise out of the way in terms of your PD teachers just get the idea that you know collaboration is essential to every lesson and you know my students can't move from their first level of thinking unless they collaborate because collaboration is 
where students move from their best to being better than their best. So many lessons, you know, we talk to teachers before we get started with this and we survey them, they have a notion that the, the, the thing they want from the students for them to do is to come and do their best. Well, your best isn't good enough because you come in the room with your best. But it's through collaboration that kids leave better than their best. So what we don't try and do is is take teachers away on a full day course about collaborative this and collaborative. We give them something they can do at points of need that they can try, have a go at, and then, with, of course, with Verso and the online component, they can evaluate the impact of that structure on student outcomes. Did it work? Because every conversation you have in terms of your own professional learning and the way you engage your students should be led by the word impact. So hmm. what was the impact of that collaborative structure on student learning? Did it make a difference? Did it shift the needle? Um, in terms of you know the learning goals, obviously, but also in terms of the way the students function and engage with one another, and and, and you know that equitable piece um, is so mission critical. Our our verso lesson structures I'm sharing at FETC require every student to leave the room having thought, had time for individual thinking, small group thinking, whole class thinking. Um, focus group with people who share the same opinion or Socratic groupings and then individual returning to individual thinking and processing. So, you know, once you get teachers across that line and thinking, rethinking what, what a lesson's all about and what learning intentions are about, then, then layering the professional learning on top of that becomes a lot easier. Interesting. So speaking of FETC, I, I did, um, I, I scrolling through your Twitter uh, account the other day and, and you dropped a bit of a hint about how <laughs> you dropped a little bit of a hint that you were going to tie your session to Ikea. And I, oh, I won't, yeah. I won't lie. I I'm, I'm sitting in a room. My office uh, is, I am surrounded by Ikea yeah. nonsense in this room. Just, it's <laughs> like, I'm, I'm, I'm so I can relate like literally, I, I I mean, I have a couch, an Ikea couch. I have a desk. I have everything is Ikea in this room. So I was like, I wonder how he's going to do that. And yep. I, can, I can see in some ways um, how learning could relate to Ikea. So, so <laughs> without dropping, without being, being um, uh, too detailed uh, in dropping your whole session on us, uh, which we wouldn't have time for, I would love to just hear how you're tying um, your, your, your session to to ikea in particular right. i'm super interested okay. in this this is like a teaser folks teaser. For, okay. for phil for phil at fetc well look ikea is something we all get and we've all struggled <laughs> building that cabinet you know i think the, the the ikea connection um in terms of learning design is you know the way we break down our standards into individual lessons and we think about sharing the learning objective for every single lesson so it's like i can when i get the ikea stuff out of the box and those those instructions with the little men and the little thing so the first lesson is i can make put these pieces of wood together and i can drill put these holes together and done lesson two i can put these four pieces of wood together lesson three i can do this bit like but at no point you know if if i didn't know i was building a draw pack those lessons become massively more difficult. My understanding isn't going to come together unless I know what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. What we often do as teachers is we don't give kids the, the, the picture on the lid of the box. This yes. is for building a bookcase. Instead of that, we give them, here's the first thing you do, here's the next thing, here's the third thing, here's the fourth thing, here's the fifth thing, and then magically hope at the end of it We've built the drawer pack and all the drawers fit. What the IKEA moment is really allowing teachers to think, well, how can we share with our students what the end game is? What's the lid on the box? What's that picture look like? Because if we don't do that, then the students are just being compliant and building the bit we give them at the time we give it to them and not actually thinking ahead and thinking, well, I get why this bit's important because we're going to need that bit because this bit's going to fit inside it. You know, we, we don't give them the opportunity to take ownership of the process. And so what I'm sharing at FETC is I've, I've mashed together all of the language um, from 
Blooms, whichever version of Blooms you're into. I'm not really a fan of Blooms, to be honest, but we'll go into that in FETC. You know, um, <coughs> Web's depth of knowledge, um, solo taxonomy, and put the language together to allow the teacher to actually think about ways of sharing that journey in a more efficient way thinking about cognitive load and the development of thinking throughout that process of building that IKEA unit. So the students, we build a common language around what it is that we're doing and so kids can actually relate to that before, during and throughout, you know, throughout the lesson space. Because otherwise kids are going in blind as to what it is they're actually doing and why it's important and why it matters because they're not seeing the connections and they can't forge connections between that bit of the building today, the bit, the next bit, the build, the next bit, the build, unless we give them the whole picture. Awesome. Well, listen, it'll be really funny to, to or not funny. It'll be super interesting to see you connect, connect <laughs> those dots at, at, at FETC. Yeah. And, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll tell people Phil is going to be there and, and he's going to tell you all about it. And maybe he'll bring some Allen keys for you to, yeah, to, I hope so. I mean, cause I mean, lots of, <laughs> that's, that's my pain point with, uh, with, with uh with ikea stuff hey, hey phil thanks for for joining us it's been been great to have you on and uh, and yeah we'll see you in a couple weeks yep. absolute Thank pleasure you. and just one last word is we're actually every strategy and structure and the vocabulary pieces everything we share fetc participates in the session we'll, we'll, we'll they'll take that away with them we're, we're leaving them with awesome. all of those resources and access to the online tools, they get all of that because they can't move forward unless they've got it. So we're giving them the whole the whole Fantastic. story. Fantastic. Yeah, and we're cool. gonna link uh, we're gonna link the URL, uh, you know, and some info on on Verso on the show notes as well, so people can take a look at That's it from great. there. Thanks so much, Phil, Thank you. for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for listening to On Education. My name is Mike Washburn, and my co-host is Glenn Irvin. Do you want to get in touch with us? Check out our website at oneducationpodcast.com. You can tweet us at oneducationpod. Glenn is at Irv Spanish on Twitter. I can be found on Twitter at Mr. Washburn. Our engineers are Jake and Justin at Podcast Production Team. Check out their website at podcastproductionteam.com. You can find us on Facebook by visiting facebook.com slash oneducationpod. If you're enjoying the show and think others would too, we'd be thrilled if you shared it with them. Please leave us a rating or review in Apple Podcasts or the Google Play Store. When you leave a rating, it gives our rankings a boost, and this helps others discover the show. We want to thank our presenting sponsor, Schoology, for supporting us. Check out Schoology.com to learn how they can help you advance what's possible. Thanks as always for listening. Stay awesome. See you soon.